Welcome to the Dexter Cast, the podcast where we explore the different perspectives on the issues that matter. I am Amr, your host and guide for today. In this episode of Beyond Human, I will discuss the video games The Last of Us and The Last of Us Part 2. The Last of Us, Part 1 When is life intelligible? When is it recognizable? When do we apprehend another, and when do we recognize them as a person? Judith Butler's Frames of War explains the frames in which we place the other. We place others in certain frames, like the circles of trust. At first, we are strangers, then we become acquaintances. If it so happens, the acquaintances become friends and some friends become family. We subconsciously determine the worth of the other's life. We will see that in the narrative from The Last of Us, video game, an interactive story told through the eyes of its characters. Our story today follows Jewel and Ellie. We are first introduced to Jewel through the eyes of his daughter, Sarah, 20 years before the events of the story on the night of the outbreak. Jewel is a hard-working man and a loving father. Quickly through the progression of the story, Sarah is shot because she is thought to be infected by the virus that is rapidly overtaking the city. Twenty years after the outbreak, the world has become an open dystopia in which the government's opposition, called the Fireflies, is treated as a terrorist organization. Jewel, no longer as likable as before, and his business partner, are tasked by the Fireflies to escort a young girl named Ellie to the Fireflies' headquarters. As it turns out, Ellie is immune to the virus. The events that occur throughout the story of the video game display the levels of grievability in Butler's frames of war to a great extent. As a player, one is immersed in an interactive narrative. In a way, the player goes on a journey with the characters, and yet Jewel is the main playable character. At moments, the game begins to pose thoughts on what really matters, who really matters. The clickers, or the zombies, are displayed as humanoid, infected characters. At one point, Tess, Jewel's business partner, and friend, explains that she does not want to turn into one of them. She does not want to live in her brain while her body takes a life of its own. She would rather die. The zombies, called the clickers, in their current state matter so little. They do not push the story forward. The only visible villain becomes the virus itself. But the clickers are just as much the victims. They do not matter. They are not even intelligible, let alone recognizable. But the others are. The factions that try to kill are intelligible. Yet they matter so little to Jewel and Ellie. Spare them when you can. But if they get in the way, it's the rule of the jungle. Survival of the fittest. And as you play as Jewel, you recognize the character, you understand more or less how he thinks, how he feels, the subtle expressions he shows when he wants to smile at something that Ellie helped him with. But the hard shell of the daughterless father does not allow him to act upon emotions. Not yet. Jewel feels the connection that he has with Ellie. She displays an image of the daughter he lost, and so she becomes recognizable. The more he interacts with her, the more she becomes apprehensible. She becomes more than a human to him, she becomes a companion. The protagonist is stricken, his wound is infected, Jewel is bedridden, and Ellie has to take care of herself and of him. All of a sudden, the player takes on Ellie's bow, hunting for deer, rabbits, whatever she can do to survive whatever she can do to help Jewel. She is no longer the tough, foul-mouthed child who wants to rebel. She takes responsibility and attempts to help by whatever means necessary. The road ahead isn't long. It wouldn't be too difficult for her to go to the headquarters of the Fireflies on her own. 
her own mission and main responsibility. Instead, she chooses to help Jewel. It is at this point in the game that the characters recognize each other as more than companions on a journey from one point to the other. Much like our human relationships evolve from strangers to acquaintances and acquaintances to friends, we see those changes happening with the seasons of the year throughout the narrative of the video game. Jewel saves Ellie, Ellie saves Jewel, and the world around them begins to matter just a little bit more. The circles tighten, and the bond of the father-daughter evolves. When we reach the conclusion of the narrative, we arrive at the headquarters, the hospital where the trained scientists and doctors will operate on Ellie. The operation will likely end in Ellie's demise. Jewel is confronted with that fact quite late, after Ellie has already been sedated. He is escorted out of the hospital, but at that point he realizes that he will lose another daughter if he does not act. And act, he does. Jewel kills everyone who stands in his way, until he reaches the operating room. The doctors and nurses scatter, but none of them matter to him. None of them hold any value to him. The only person he will grieve is Ellie, and so he kills them. The Last of Us, Part 2 The second part of the video game splits into two stories. Through those stories, we shall explore the precarious life and the grievable life, the concepts that Butler wrote about in Frames of War. We start the game at Jules Brothers Farm, Tommy's Farm, a community that resembles the old life before the pandemic. Life is good on the farm. People drink, they dance, they sing. They love even with clickers at the gate. It's some years after the events of the first story. Jewel has aged and grayed even more. Ellie has grown into a young woman who still questions the past. Could her life be the one to save all others? Was her life more meaningful than everyone who died without the antidote that could have been developed from her? There is a wound that has not yet healed, a wound of broken trust. Yet she loves Jewel all the same. He is still the surrogate father. Jewel and his brother, Tommy, go for a supply run. They come across a strong survivor by the name of Abby, and they invite her and her companions to join the farm. They fight against hordes of clickers, but they survive together. And all of a sudden, a moment of betrayal happens when Abby shoots Jewel. She murders him ruthlessly in front of both his brother and surrogate daughter. The outrageous moment of Jewel's death brought fans to their knees. It humbled them. And in that, the character, a fictional character in a video game, becomes more grievable than a living stranger whom we never know about. The reaction of the players is perhaps a moment that shows that even post-human, a binary code of a computer system can be of value and importance. Jewel's murder brings Ellie on a revenge route to find and kill Abby, his assailant, and revenge she gets from all of Abby's friends, whom we begin to realize had a life of their own. The mechanics of the video game play a role into that, as with each non-playable character's death, we become aware that those characters, those people, had lives, connections, and relationships that deemed them human in their moment of death. We begin to question Ellie and her ruthlessness. She is not so much unlike Abby, whom we know so little about until that moment. When Abby and Ellie finally come across each other, 
We stand at a stalemate. They both survive and live another day to the discontent of the players. That's when things become different. We suddenly are placed in Abby's shoes. We see through her eyes the events that made her the jewel killer we have come to identify her as. Abby is the daughter of the doctor that Jewel killed at the end of the first story. The day that Ellie gained the father and Jewel gained the daughter was the day that Abby lost the father. When we go through the flashbacks of her life with that father, we discover that they are not so different from Jewel and Ellie themselves. We discover that the relationship was human, and when Abby loses her father, she swears revenge on the man who killed him. That becomes the purpose of her life for years until she finally achieves it. And then we are confronted with the relationships, the friends that Ellie had murdered. They too, as we suspected, were humans. They had goals, they had dreams, love lives, and they all wanted a better future. When we reach the end of the game, with all that we know about Ellie and Abby at that point, we are no longer stuck in the frame that some lives are precarious. We are confronted with the harsh fact that lives, even those that we don't know about, actually matter just as much. All life is grievable. In the upcoming episode of Beyond Human, we will continue to explore literature, film, and video games from a post-humanist and ontopolitical perspective. Next time, we will discuss Shaun of the Dead with Nora Neve.